Okay, well, welcome to this next lecture uh, on Python. We're going to be extending our work a bit further this week. We're going to be looking at uh, selection, iteration. We're going to use some operators, and we're going to start to put things into uh, functions, code uh, functions to be able to do certain tasks. So let's recap on our previous lecture, where we uh, explored sequence in the last lecture. Remember, that was... Uh, the um, order in which that code statements execute. So they always start at the top and then work their way down, line by line. Uh, one line terminates and then the next one runs. Okay, they, they don't run in random, they don't just pick random ones at random and run those, they run in a very uh, sequential order. Okay, so we, that's basically what we did in the previous session. We just uh, started at the top and went through line by line. Okay, but in this uh, lecture, we're going to be exploring uh, ways to select between blocks of code. So we may not run every single line in our uh, script that we write. We may select blocks and uh, parts of code to run, and we may not run others. And then we're also going to explore the idea of repeating blocks of code to save us having to write them multiple times, basically duplicating the code blocks. We want to write them once so that we can then reuse that. That's uh, one of the principles of object orientation, is to be able to write it once and use it many times. Okay, So those are some free uh, kind of fundamental parts to programming. The sequence in which statements are run, the ability to select between them, and the ability to repeat them. Or the technical word would be to iterate over them. Okay, So we're going to be building on that this week. So we'll start with selection and then move on to a series of different operators, which there are uh, three different camps. Uh, the comparison operators, the arithmetic operators, mathematics, you've seen them before, and logical operators, you may have uh, seen those before too. Okay, and then we'll move to iteration, repetition, and then start to create some basic functions in which we can uh, delegate uh, our sections of code to functions and then call them to be able to execute those blocks of code. Okay, so... Let's start with selection. So remember, this is the ability to select between blocks of code. And how do we do that? Well, we would have a condition which will determine whether we run that block of code. So let's have a look at this example here. We've got three lines. And uh, we, first of all, uh, remember from the previous lecture, we have a variable. Remember, we don't need the type to be declared in Python. Um, Let's just test your memories. What type of data, though, is being stored? Even though we don't declare it, can we tell what type of data is going to be stored there? Integer. It's an integer, yeah. It's a whole number. Quite, quite uh, clearly tells us that, doesn't it? I haven't got a decimal place. Uh, if we did, we could assume it's a floating point number. In this case, we assume it's integer because it's a whole number. Okay, so the equal sign or we know that in programming as the assignment operator, we'll assign that to the left-hand side. So score has the value of 45. And then here, we have a comparison taking place. We say if the, what was the value of, of score? 45. 45, good, yes, so remember that's, that's what we signed there. So if 45 is greater than or equal to 40, if that evaluates to true, then colon, print out this message, mirroring the university uh, format, of course, uh, a score higher than 40, a mark higher than 40, means you pass the module, something you'll all be familiar with. So, um, that's the programming, and we could just translate that. If we, if we haven't seen it before, um, I like to think of it in terms of just breaking it down. So like we just did, focusing on what the value of score is, 45, is the value of 45 greater than or equal to 40? Is 45 greater than 40, in other words? Is that true or false? True. It's true, yeah. So it's something we would know. Uh, so it's true, therefore, the key thing here of our programming, if that's true, we therefore run this block of code, as we would see here. Okay, so that's uh, a very simple example of selection. Uh, we could then scale that up exactly to include else, yeah. So there might be a case if it's not true. We want to be able to cater for that. 
So we can add in an else statement there. Okay, and I've actually changed the value of score now. <laughs> so let's just update that in our memory. So score now has the value of 35. Is 35 greater than or equal to 40? Yeah. It's not, is it? It's false. Okay, so do we run this, this line here? No. We don't do it, because that has to be true in order to run that. So what we see here is, well, if, if that's not true, well, do something else, essentially. Else, if that wasn't true, print this out. Okay, so either print this or this. Print this if that's true, but print this if it's false. So, in other words, uh, it's false, therefore, oh, we've got the English here <laughs> to be able to translate that. So, we've established 35 is less than 40. In other words, it's not greater than 40. Therefore, we wouldn't execute the first if statement. We can't run that, but we can run else, this message here. We didn't score higher than 40. We need to try the assignment again. Okay? So we've got that binary logic, essentially. It's either true or false, isn't it? Like we established in the previous session, Boolean values, we're checking here if true. If something is true, we've, comp we've compared numbers in this case. It could be literally any type of data. We could be looking at, are we looking at the same object? Um, are we looking at the right name of something? Uh, it could be strings, could be letters, could be symbols, could be digits, could be absolutely anything. As long as it will compare with and evaluate to true, um, we can write conditional statements, if and else. Okay, so that binary logic there in this case. So if it's true, run this. If it's not true, else, otherwise false, run something else. Okay, so there we go. So that's if and else, fairly simple, I hope. <laughs> um, there's only one other part to add in, which is L if. Else if. Else if, yeah, it's the amalgamation of else if. If you're from other languages, the C family languages, or um, Java has it as well. Uh, we have else if in those languages. Python's just put the two together. Uh, the EL from else and the if. If, obviously, and put it as elif. Okay. Um, so we've now got three different conditional statements. Let's uh, run them through. Oh, okay, so in this case, I <laughs> want uh, to think about this one. So because of the structuring score, we updated that to 55. Okay, so is 55 greater than or equal to 40? True. It's true. Therefore, we run this line of code, and we, and we pass. <laughs> um, so the logic we might need to update a little bit here, um, because we actually run this, because that's else, that would have to assume that was false to be able to run it. And likewise, else would have to assume that's false to be able to uh, run it. So therefore, we actually just run the first one. I mean, if, if we had this as if, we'd run both of them, because actually both could be true at the same time. But because we've put elif and else, that means the above has to be false uh, to be able to actually run them. We've basically got exclusivity here. We only want to run one of these messages. We don't really want a case of running all of them, especially if they're different grade classifications or different boundaries or things. Um, we only want to see one of them. So let's update the logic. And uh, I've switched them around, actually, in this case. I've put uh, the Great one first. Oh, and I've actually updated 45 as well, just to illustrate how our SIF would work. So let's go through again. Score is now 45. We signed that at the start. So let's, run, let's check the first one. Is score, which has the value of 45, 45 good, follow me. 45, is that greater than or equal to 50? False. False. So do we print this? No. No, we don't, do we? No. Okay. So else. Otherwise, check the next one. Is score, which was still 45, we haven't updated it, is 45 greater than or equal to 40? Yes. Yes, true. Yeah, it is. So therefore, we print, we pass, okay? And we only print that because, of course, we don't need to run the else, we don't need to check it because it's only going to be one of them. That's why we've got the exclusivity there. Okay, so that's uh, hopefully illustrating there for you the difference between just having separate if statements. Because we could actually just make them all of segments, beginners do, when they're just getting started. But of course, uh, as we illustrated, it could be, uh, more than one could be true. 
there may be certain, certain circumstances where actually you do want to run multiple if statements. But I think probably in this scenario, and eventually we'll go on and build, uh, let's say, a ladder, else if a ladder of uh, different grade classifications, different messages we want to output. In that eventuality, because we can't get both a 55 and a 45, <laughs> we only fit into one of the two uh, boundaries, the ranges, we don't want to print one message for that. Okay, so hope that makes sense there. To illustrate all three components, if, else, if, and else. Okay, so use ones, um, you may need just need if. It really depends on the scenario as to what you're trying to do. But they're just tools that you can uh, use uh, depending on what you're, you're trying to output. Okay, so there we go. That's uh, the Python way of doing it. So in other languages, we, we did reference uh, some of them. Um, other languages also have alternate means of performing selection. They can use what's known as a switch statement. I don't know if anyone's used a switch statement before, but uh, they actually have a series of different cases and um, they lend themselves to, let's say, categorical data where there are a limited range of values and um, uh, like letters, for example, if uh, A grade, if B grade, or, or in, this, in the switch case, it would, be, it would be case. So test the variable, and then if the case is A, run, a block, run some code, and then if case is B, run that. You could uh, just select between a limited range of values. There could be letters, there could also be numbers as well. It could be a limited range of digits. Um, they don't work so well with ranges, though. That's the other thing. So obviously, with our previous examples, uh, where we're looking at a range of of, well, we will go on to look at a range of values, sorry, uh, between a certain, uh, like a 40 and a 49, a 50 and a 59, 60, 69, and 70 to 100, in the case of uh, great boundaries, then um, that would be harder to do with switch cases, because they're only focused on certain uh, values. You can have the equivalent of the OR operator if you put the colon in, um, but uh, anyway, um, we don't have to worry about that because uh, Python doesn't have it. So we can't, we can't use switch anyway. Uh, there's, also the, there's also this uh, question mark uh, symbol operator known as the ternary operator. There's loads of other names as well, like the conditional if operator um, uh, too. And um, that uh, can be a very efficient way of performing if and else. And, and Python, it, does, it doesn't use the um, question mark, but it can actually arrange it. It can actually reuse if and else. It can actually uh, reposition those to perform something very similar to the, uh, the ternary style of things. Um, with the ternary operator, the, uh, it would usually go there, the question mark, after the, the condition check. So it's actually switched these around. Um, in Python, though, we've actually got the, uh, the value to be assigned um, if the condition is true on the left-hand side of the statement. We actually put the condition in the middle there, the comparison, and um, if that was false, else, as we saw in the previous slides, then um, that will be the value to assign if that uh, condition, that comparison, uh, turned out to be false. So we could actually use the if and else on the same line, basically. We could reposition it to be able to get the functionality of the ternary operator, the question mark in other languages, um, but it does use the same uh, keywords, if and else, uh, to the if and else uh, ladders that we could create. So we don't need to worry about elif in the in the case, this case because there's only going to be two two options to it. Okay, so different ways of, of using it, but centrally in Python we have to use if and else and elif to be able to perform uh, selection. Uh, one of the key things also to mention, I'll remind you at the end as well, is that selection we're only running the block of code once. We select between blocks of code, we don't repeat blocks of code. If I had a penny for every time I heard a student say an if loop, I might just be rich. <laughs> uh, but uh, if is not a loop, got to go separate them. Okay, we will go on to look at loops, but if statements only run once. Okay, you can put them in a loop, but on their own, uh, they're only going to run once. So it's like between them. So, Four more loops. Yes, exactly. We're going to go on to look at four loops. Yes, that's a loop. That's an example of a loop. But if is not a loop, 
Okay, just to make sure you remember that, if it's not a loop. All right, so let's move on. Let's have a look at some operators then. Now that we've established the basics of uh, selection, let's have a look at, first of all, uh, comparison operators. So uh, we've seen a few of them. Uh, you, we saw some of these in the previous example. We looked at the, the greater than or equal. Um, we don't have to use the equal, equality um, operator. We could just say greater than or less than. That's the uh, simple that way. So um, uh, we could combine them, of course, as we've seen. We can have we can combine them with equality. So they have to be either greater than or equal. It could be one of the two. Um, good for testing boundary values as well um, uh, to get into. Um, and we've also got equality and uh, not equal, or the inequality, I suppose you could say, operator. And um, I think one of the key distinctions to make is that with the equality operator, we've got two equal signs, different to assignment. We've only got one equal sign. Okay, so that's a key difference between the two. All right, and you also notice that that equal sign in the greater than or equal is combined with the greater than or less than. All right, so again, they're, they're not orphans; they're part of the same two, essentially replacing uh, that second one. All right, and likewise, the not equal to or the inequality likewise has an exclamation point uh, there, which is the reverse of equality. Got a few things just to uh, probe you on that, just to test you on it. Uh, here's the map of what they would all return. Again, they're, they're going to result with true or false. It not, it's not might be greater than or seventy percent less than. It's either true or false. Either it is less than or it's not, or it's greater than or it's not. So um, we can apply those operators again to get a boolean uh, results, a boolean return. Okay, remember capital T and capital F in Python 2, just in case you compare them with true later, you might also do that. Um, so those are things to be aware of with our operators, and we're going to use them basically to perform comparisons, aren't we? As we saw in the previous uh, examples, to be able to uh, run blocks of code if that comparison evaluates to true. Same with uh, iteration as well, when we get there, we're going to see that. Um, so we've, we've sort of seen this before. Um, We've got a few other examples. Uh, I won't drill you on this one, but obviously, uh, 45 is the value we assigned to score, and that is greater than or equal to 40. Uh, let's just check you on this one. Um, what's the result of that going to be? Yeah, it is, isn't it? They're exactly the same value. Yeah, very good. Ooh, how about this one, though? Yeah, so type is important, isn't it? And that matters, even though semantically, uh, it's 45, it, they have the same semantic meaning, um, the, they're treated as different in terms of the type, they're not of the same type, uh, even more specifically they're not of the same memory, size or location, um, so they are uh, not equal, false, uh, the result of that, I was just testing on this one actually, uh, what would the result of this Comparison B. Is that false? It is false, yeah. yeah. We've got to flip the logic. <laughs> Just if, uh, that means it's not equal to the yes. information mark in the US. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's not equal to the US. Yeah. I, I, Getting it right. Getting it right, yeah, in your head, exactly. Because yeah. we look at it and we say, oh, they are equal, so it could be true, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to reverse that. Um, that's usually one of the things I, I try and do when I'm, when I'm thinking clearly, is to establish are they equal and then just reverse it if I've got the not there. Uh, unless you can do it really quickly, of course, and you can establish that's false, but uh, that's how I would do it sequentially. Um, so yes, just be aware of that, uh, they're not equal to. Um, uh, indeed, you might even see that combined with uh, functions as well. You see that in other languages where they just put a, a exclamation point. So is this not, this variable, is it not true? Um, to be able to establish that and, and run a certain uh, block of code, repeat it if it's uh, not true. Okay, so those are the, those are the comparison operators. We're going to be essential for both selection and iteration. Uh, let's have a look at some maths now, some arithmetic operators. I'm sure 
things you will know. Uh, we obviously know the, the plus sign is used for addition. We did see it used in the context of concatenation. So that modeled the principle of overloading in the previous uh, lecture, where we could change the behavior of the plus sign dependent upon its context. Okay. Uh, minus sign for subtraction also could be used to indicate a negative value if you put it in front of a, a digit, of course. Uh, division, um, not used as the horizontal line in maths. Um, we can't do that. Instead, we do the forward slash. Okay. And likewise, multiplication. We don't write the, the character X. We don't use the key X on the keyboard. Uh, we would use the asterisk for multiplication. Okay. There's a few others. I, I don't know if you've used these before, but there is the percentage sign. Does anyone know what the percentage sign will return or provide? Isn't that modulus? So the modulus, yeah, or in other words, what the does it give the remainder? Exactly, so it's not the number of whole times that a number goes into another number, it's the remainder from that. And that's going to be quite useful for patterns. Um, for example, if you did a positive value, modulo um, divided by 2, for example, 4 divided by 2, well, that goes in perfectly twice, has a remainder of 0, but then if we do 5 modulo 2, we get 1, as a remainder, because it goes in twice, remainder one. We do six. Six goes in perfectly, gives us zero. So we actually get alternating patterns, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So that might be useful for certain scenarios. We want to provide alternating outputs. And you can also scale up as well. You don't have to, you're not limited to just two. You can divide uh, modulo three, four. We get zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, for four different alternating sequences. Um, so that's, that's quite useful to know that. Um, also for reducing um, uh, data structures as well. That's, a more, like, that's the next step coming down the line, data structures, but useful for reducing down the total uh, size of a structure using the modular sign. So a very practical symbol, actually, is the percentage sign modulus. Used in a lot of different places. Okay, so that's one. And then we've also got two other extensions of what we'd know as division and multiplication. We've actually got floor division, which is two forward slashes. I don't think anyone's used that before or wants to have a guess at what that might translate into. Floor division. I'm stood on the floor, you're sitting on the floor. Obviously, it's indicating the floor of something rather than the ceiling of something. So if you divide one number by another, let's just say 5 divided by 2, we'd know that literally to be 2.5. That sits right in the middle, doesn't it? Um, but if we use floor division, we would tell it to oh, round. Doesn't it doesn't give you the lower number. The lower number, yes, exactly. That's what it's going to do, yeah. Uh, floor, hence pointing downwards, even though... Um, well, I suppose if we had 2.5 literally as an integer and we didn't use floor division and we tried to store it, well, uh, you could use the round function, but um, uh, in other languages it would just literally cut off the uh, decimal point. So that's another way uh, to do it, but uh, if you want to be very precise, um, if you get that 2.4 or, or even, you, yeah, you might get 2.6, you might still want to say we're only interested in the, in the smallest whole number. Um, for that context, so we could use we could use that. Okay, and then finally, the asterisk asterisk is power off. Okay, so we could write something like five uh, star star asterisk asterisk uh, two, which would be five to the power of two, twenty five, and likewise five cubed five asterisk asterisk three gives us five to the power of three as well. And there we go. We've just got the uh, the table of that. To be able to use those. So obviously you all know the addition, subtraction, division, we've established there. It literally is 2.5 and multiplication is quite easy. The mod gives us the remainder. In that case, uh, 50 modulo 4, uh, well, um, 10 times 4 is 40, you've got 44, 48, and then you've got the two remainder, haven't you? So it doesn't, it doesn't actually give you how many whole times it goes in, it's only interested in the remainder. Okay, if you wanted the whole number, I suppose you'd have to work out the literal division 
and take that uh, using the floor division to get that or just cut it off, put it as converted to an integer, I suppose, would give you that whole number of times. Okay. And then finally, as we established, five asterisk asterisk uh, is the power of 25 in this case. Okay. Uh, so let's just test precedence. How well do you remember bod mass or bid mass from your mathematics classes? What would the output of this expression be? Give that a go. Think about sequencing. Think about order. Which one comes first? Isn't it two divided by the four? Oh, I think two divided by four. Okay, so that gives us. Um, wouldn't that end up with 16 then? So, uh, two divided by four. Oh. Well, that'd be half, yeah. wouldn't it? Yes, okay, so uh, eight, the power of half. It's a mean number. <laughs> okay. Um, minus one is one. Yeah. It's eight to the power of a half. <laughs> Let's see, that's Siri. 2.8284. Ooh, okay. That doesn't sound right. Right, it's not. So actually, the precedence is to do that first. I wouldn't be so mean to give you an example like that. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would give you something that's worked out. So we actually do the first half. Okay, powers come first. Um, so, 8 to the power of 2, 8 squared, 64, divided by 4 is then 16. Okay, so you've got to think through the sequencing of the precedence there. Um, how about this one? Which one of these comes first? Think about what we just said. Which one of the two are we going to do? Are we going to add 4 with 4 first, or are we going to do 4 squared first? 4 squared first. We are, yes. 4 squared, 4 times 4, 16. There we go. Plus 4 gives us 20. Okay. Uh, one more. Let's just test this one. <laughs> Did the brackets come first, or does the square come first? It's the thing in the brackets first. It's the brackets first. It is. Brackets, it is. operations, division. Uh, multiplication, addition, subtraction. Uh, I, I think so. I think. I think. Yeah. I think it is that. It's different for everyone. It's Add indices. Indices. Yeah. Bit mass. Bit mass. Yeah. You might get that. Okay. Bit mass. Bit mass. There's some complete other one. There's, 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 there's one pendas pendas. in the states. As we got when I went to college there. Oh, I yeah. spent ages learning bit mass, and they went, "Oh, pendas." I'm like, "What?" <laughs> there's there's, 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 there's going to update my memory. Yeah. And there, there's there's a lot, isn't there? And obviously, this is this is literally just um, a gymnastics. This wouldn't be quite so practical. Unless you want to put a, write a scientific equation or something into your code, there will be math libraries that do that for you, obviously. But just just worth kind of testing our boundaries and testing our memory. So obviously we do the four plus four first gives us eight. Eight to the power of two. Eight times eight, sixty-four. Okay. So just a little test because I, I would have given you some easy ones, but I know you could do those. Uh, so I wanted to give you the hard ones just to test your memory. Push the boundaries. All right, so there we go. There's the arithmetic operators. And then uh, we've got one more camp to look at, which is the logical operators. And uh, you might have done these before. Uh, we've got logical and, in fact, indeed, there's a lot more than this too, um, but we don't get native uh, ways to implement that in Python. We have to combine them, like X and or X or. Um, here in, in, in Python, most programming languages, we just get uh, logical and. Uh, oh, does anyone know what's key about and? Does anyone remember what their key thing is? There with it. I'm going to know it, but it's going to not be key to me because I've memorised it. You've memorised it, okay. All right, fine. So it's going to be obvious. It will be obvious. No, it will be obvious, yeah. Okay, all right. We'll look at an example. Um, so here we go. Here's the example. If we have x and y, both x and y have to be true in order for the overall condition to be true. So this is a way to actually combine lots of separate comparisons. Remember we had in the first few slides we have just one. Is the value of score greater than this value? We might also combine that with all. Oh, and is score less than another value? And in that case, each comparison is tested individually and if we're using the AND operator, the logical operator, then those, if we have two, both of them have to be true. If we're using lots of comparisons, all of them have to be true. So AND means 
all of them have to be true, which is in direct contrast to the logical or operator, either x or y can be true. So x could be true, y might be false, but as long as one of them is true, then the overall condition will be true, and then if it's part of a block, that will run. Okay, part of a condition to run that block, that's going to allow it to run. Okay, so that's the two different logical ways to combine it. What's got not? Which again, remember, that's the reverse of something. So if x was true, uh, we might test to see if x is not true. Okay, so it's going to reverse. Uh, it's only going to be. It's only going to run if x is, uh, is false. Okay, whatever we put it in. All right. So here's we've done just that. We've come. We put two condition, two comparisons in now. So score forty five. We've got one comparison happening, and we've got a second comparison happening. Okay. So is score greater than or equal to forty? It is, yeah, it's true. Okay, and is score less than or equal to 100? Also yes. Also yes, okay, so both are true. Do we run this code? Yes. We do, yes, because and it means that both of them have to be true. This must be true and this must be true. To be able to print out, you passed. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's uh, use all now. Let's flip things around. Okay, so sign 101 to the score. Okay, is score less than zero? Is 101 less than zero? It's not. Okay, but, or, is score 101 greater than 100? Yes, it is. It is. So, ooh, one of them is true, so am I going to run this code? If it's or, it will run? It will, because only one of them. Yeah, you're Either one of them. Is one to be yeah, true. I only need one of them to be true, yeah. I mean, even it could be the case that both of them might be true. Uh, in this context, it wouldn't be, because we can't have a number that is both <laughs> greater than 100, and also, at the same time, well, not in this universe, at least, maybe in a parallel uh, universe, quantum computing, that might be true, to have two values at the same time. But uh, <laughs> physical, uh, what we're dealing with the reality right now, at least we know, um, is that only one is either going to be greater than 100 or less than uh, zero. But in this case, Again, they're used entirely upon context. Um, in this case, it so happens that I can combine conditions uh, unless I wanted to really separate them, just to, just to prove to you, of course. I mean, I could write them separately to say the mark is greater than 100 or the mark is less than zero. Um, in this case, the semantic meaning is that they're both incorrect, they're not within the defined uh, boundary that should be a resulting mark. I can't give students minus 799 for their assignments or 5,822. Completely disrupt a <laughs> the grading system. So, um, uh, yeah, we've got defined boundaries and it's just a way to combine them. But that's the key difference, isn't it? All means either of them uh, could be true. You can even have a long list. Uh, you can have five comparisons. As long as one of them is true, then it's going to execute the code in the statement. But with AND, all of them must be true. All of the individual comparisons must be true uh, to be able to run that block. Okay? So, some things to think through with our operators. Now that we've been through them, uh, we can apply them to our selection statements and also uh, with iteration as well. That's one of the things we are uh, going to proceed on to do. Okay. Right. So, let's, look at, let's switch gears now and think about how we repeat blocks of code. So, you notice here, in this block of code, uh, I haven't used the keyword if. I've got the keyword while, as mentioned earlier. In Python, we can use the while loop. Okay, so let's let's try and break it down. It's a, it's a level up from selection, I think, because we're actually combining an awful lot of things. We've got uh, variables being declared. We have actually got a comparison happening as well, and then we've got iteration. It's actually gone a level level up from what we've previously seen. So let's break it down. Let's consider one line at a time. Okay, so a variable i has the value of zero. So we've seen before. Okay, so we've got that in our memories. Right. Okay, so while i value currently zero is less than three. First of all, let's establish, is that true? Is i less than three? Yes. It is. Zero is less than three, yes. So therefore, 
I'm going to run this block of code. First one is print. Okay, it's a printout loop. Um, that's a print statement. Uh, value is currently zero. We get this little output just to give us an indication of, uh, of what's happening. Zero is first. Okay, that's the first thing that we're going to see. Ah, and then we have this. Does anyone know what that is doing? This final is that statement. Adding, adding one to the current value. The it is indeed. It is because I was up until that point still zero, wasn't it? So I will now become what? One. One. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not sure. Question. Okay. In other languages, you might see I plus plus. That's different. Not both of those different. So I've seen them. Oh sure. Have you ever seen i equals i plus one? Oh yeah, that too. You could write it like that. Yeah, that would be an even, that would be another way of doing, performing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I suppose I have combined them here just to help you think about what it does. But yeah, it's exactly the same as that. Um, Python, a Python point of trivia is that we can't have the plus plus operator, the increment operator. Uh, there's a reason why I've come on to that. But we can't do that. Uh, so instead, yeah, you, Tyler's right. We could say i equals i plus one, or the short, even shorter, would just be say i plus equals one. Uh, we have to, um, inc we have to both, um, assign a new value to what was the previous value of it, which is zero. So zero plus one and assign it. Okay, right. So we've come to the end of our while loop or the block in this while statement. We're not going to go right back to the top. That would kind of defeat the point of adding <laughs> uh, one to one to uh, i, wouldn't it? If we just immediately set it back to zero again. We never press, we never go on from there. So we're not going to re go, we're not going to go back higher than the while loop. We're only going to go back to the top of this uh, while statement here. So what what value did we assign to i? What's the value of i at this point? One. One, correct. Is one less than three? It is, okay. So we're actually going to run again, aren't we? Because we're going to repeat whilst this is true. It's still true. One is less than three, it's still true, so therefore run it again. Okay, so we get the second one coming up, which is from zero to one, just to prove to us. And then, what do we do? We increase it. Yeah, so I was one, add one to it, and assign it there, so I is now two. Okay, we do it again, we go back to the top. Is two less than three? Yes, it is. So we run it again, we see that. Uh -huh. And now, the final bit, uh, we add one to I, I was two, so now three, and let's test it. Is three less than three? No. It's not. So do I run code? No. No, I don't. No, exactly, because I have to be, this had to be true, didn't it? Uh, but it's false, so therefore, stop the loop. We've finished the loop. We've, we've set a condition. We're only repeating whilst true. Once it's false, we stop. Done. Loop over, finished. So we see that as our final output. Repeated three times. We started at zero in this instance just to print out what those values were, just so we could see them uh, literally increasing, just so we've got some sort of visual indicator. But yes, that's illustrating this block of code being repeated whilst a certain condition, a form of comparison in this case, is true. Okay, uh, let's modify this a little bit, and let's actually change the value of output. The only thing that we've changed here is what we see being printed to the screen. Now, I've put i plus 1 in the printout, which we've got to remember that is actually separate to the assignment, the increment that's happening here. Okay, so the first time we get it, i was 0, and only temporarily for the output am I going to increase the value at the output. I'm not actually assigning it to i. That's the key here. It's, the i still has the value of zero. So when it comes back to this, it's still zero plus equals one. Okay, and then we go back to with one, and then one plus one is two to get that, and then increment it. Finally, uh, two, two plus one is three there. So I'm only just offsetting it by one. Um, a zero starting at zero is obviously a throwback to using arrays because they're zero indexed. Um, so that's usually why you see a lot of things start at zero. Um, in this case, a bit more intelligent though might be we might want to start at one 
if we're counting. For an output, we may not want it to be zero. Uh, enter the first number rather than enter the zero for number. Okay. So that might be a way just to logically offset what we see printed to the screen. But just be aware it's, it's not affecting the actual value of i. It's just temporary. Okay. All right. So that is the while loop. We have another keyword we could use, which is the for keywords. Now, very traditional, very uh, popular, very famous in programming is the for loop. Um, it looks slightly different in Python, though. If you've used other languages, you may have seen for int i equals zero, i less than a number, five or something, and then i plus plus. That's all bundled up in a traditional for loop uh, line. In Python, we've got something slightly different. We've got for i in range of a range <laughs> between one and four in this case. This is interesting. So we didn't even have to give it a value. We didn't even give I a value at the start. <laughs> it's just going to use that as a placeholder literally for the starting at one and then going up for this range between the range of, of one and four. Wow, interesting, we go up to the upper boundary. Um, we start at one, but we go up to one less than that boundary. So we actually see one, two, three. Okay. So um, we're not going up to four in this instance. We're just doing one, two, three. That's good. Uh, one, two, three. Okay. We can also use it for uh, names as well. So we can actually apply it to strings. Uh, we can start with a string and actually repeat for every character in uh, the string. It's treated like a, a list of, of characters, each one is separate. We can go through, print them out one at a time. So for each new line, print out a new character, as we, as we see there. So another way that we could use the for in, um, the for in loop looks different to the for, the traditional for loop. Okay worth remembering that. So you could use it as four in range, uh, four digits, that's obviously quite useful, or um, if you have a size, you could, you could also put it in there. Um, we can also actually state the, uh, the variable name as well, in this case, if that was a value, it would do it for that. that. Or if it is uh, strength, it's obviously going to print that in there. So um, that is uh, two different ways that we can do iteration in uh, Python. In other languages, we also have the do while loop, uh, which you would start with do, and uh, you would then have the while loop at the bottom of the uh, block of code. So we actually automatically run the first, uh, uh, the first block at least once because the condition, the check, happens at the end, not at the start. So we don't actually have that, that feature in Python. We can't do that. Um, we could rearrange the while loop to be able to do that, of course. We could have a check at the start and then, and then proceed on from there. Um, but we, we don't physically have the capacity to do that in Python. Likewise, we don't have the traditional for loop either in Python. We can't write something like that. Uh, declare a variable um, and give it a value. And likewise, uh, have the condition and the iteration. We don't have the increment operator in that. Uh, either anyway, so uh, we can't do the traditional for loop in Python, so therefore we use for in, as showed previously, um, to be able to achieve a range of values, uh, which I suppose you could equate that to the for each loop from previous uh, languages, which uh, the C family have, as well as Java, which again has a different syntax to the traditional for loop, uh, for each loop. Okay, so Python is more aligned with the for each loop than the traditional for loop. We mentioned that the do while loop is not present in Python. Um, and also, oh, one point I, I hinted at it earlier, the reason why we don't have the increment operator in Python, we had to use plus equals one rather than i plus plus, um, is that it's due to the structure. Remember in the very first lecture we showed you that the types in Python are treated as classes. They're not primitive types. So Java and, and the C family allow you to have integers as a primitive type. They're not built as classes, so therefore you don't have to have an object of them to be able to uh, form additional or mathematics um, calculations on them. Okay, but in Python they are, they're classes. The int is a class, so we can't just say plus plus. 
we would uh, we have to actually assign a value to it, assign a memory space to that object. Okay, where that where that value is going to be placed. Okay, so that's the reason we don't have it. But as as mentioned, we could just say i equals i plus plus i <laughs> i equals i plus one. We could say that as an alternative to i plus equals one. Okay, so. Just to remind you, <laughs> uh, there is a key difference, isn't there, between selection and iteration. So selection, then we have statements like if and else. They run only once. We select between blocks of code. We don't repeat them. Remember, it's not an if loop. <laughs> it's not a loop. Uh, it only runs once. So we only run that block of code once, providing that comparison, that condition is true. If it's not true, we could even run the else block or just not run anything. And we have elif as well in the middle. That's very different to the iterative statements like while or for, which will repeat whilst that comparison is true, whilst that evaluates the true, as demonstrated in the slides. Okay, so key distinction between them. Okay, just remember that. Just remember that they perform very different functions. You can combine them, obviously, but remember separately they, they do different things. So just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, let's finish up with some functions. Okay, we hinted at this earlier. We're going to start to delegate, start to portion blocks of code to named blocks. So a function, ideally, describes a block of code that performs one task. It's probably advantageous to us to have it do one task only. Otherwise, we get into lots of uh, appended uh, function names, uh, print out the name, and also get the input, and also perform calculation at the same time. That's going to be a very long function name, not ideal. It would be better to actually separate them for the purpose of reuse, by the way. So we could run get input a number of times, and then also do the calculation a number of times, and we could also output multiple times if we need to, as and when. But if we put them all in the same block of code, we're going to have a sequence, we run everything from start to finish, we're going to do everything every time we call the function. So better organization, better design, is to put them into defined and named blocks of code which describe what they do. Okay, so that's, that's the idea, that's kind of the goal of what we're aiming for. Okay, so consider this. The key word in, in Python is def, def for define. Define this function, this block of code, give it a name, okay? The Python convention is to use underscores, so uh, we've got that language, that terminology here, def get underscore inputs. So hopefully, if we've named it well, we can kind of find out, at least uh, discern what it's going to do, it's going to give us an input of some kind, okay? Uh, and that's exactly what I'm going to do here. So use the inputs function from the Python previous lecture, remember? That's going to put a little box out to the screen, ask us to enter in something. And then all of that, whatever we type in, is actually going to be returned by the function. So we're getting into uh, flow here. It really depends on where you declare your function as to whether you need to return something. In this case, I'm actually going to uh, uh, put it in the, the same code cell in Anaconda. Of course, when you start branching and having bigger, uh, larger uh, programs, you might have dedicated scripts, dedicated files for your Python code. Um, but in this case, we've got it all in the same cell. So, it's, and actually order is quite important here as well, because notice I'm defining the function first. Now, I need to define my function to be able to then call it. It's key. If I try and call a function that hasn't been defined, I've got nothing to call. It's not been defined yet. So I need to define it first. Define that function first. Okay. And then I can call it. How do we call it? We just state the name of the function. And just like we call all our other functions, like print, remember that's an example of function. Input is an example of function. Uh, those all have curly brackets, don't they? We call them parentheses. Okay. We do the same with our functions that we define. Okay, so we put a pair of parentheses there, and we can then call it, and then use that. It's returning a value, it's assigning it to name, and then we're going to print it. So, uh, breaking it down, let's look at it bit by bit. First of all, we define the function. Let's run this. First, we define it. Okay, whenever right to left, right to left happens, we're going to call this bit first, 
and then return it. And likewise, even when we get to this line of code, we're going to call this first, which is going to trigger this, and then return it to there. So we've defined it. We're not running it, we're just defining it. When we call it, we actually then execute that function. So at this point is when we see this. We see identity name. Okay, it's just going to wait for me to type something in because the flow went from here to there. Okay, so I called this block of code. So we're going up to here. Get input describes that I should run the input statement, just as you would outside of a function. Okay, so we're going to see that. Once I type something in, I hit enter. Now, that is going to be returned. So I typed in nick. So essentially, this will read return nick as a string. Remember, input return string. So when I come back to this line, that is going to be the, the value of this variable here, name. Just like you would assign any other value, uh, the only difference is that I've got it from a function this time, which is essentially a wrapper for input. If I wanted to condense this, I could just say name equals input, like we did in the first lecture. Okay, But I'm going to start to um, delegate my code and start to apportion it to two different blocks so I could run it multiple times. I might want to get the input a number of different times throughout the program. Um, so I could even call this get name to be even more prescriptive, get the name, but simply uh, return it, saw it in name, and now I can print it as we see here. Okay, so we're all we're doing really all the kind of things we have done before. The only difference is we've got a named block of code now for functions. So let's just remind you of the syntax. Def is going to be quite important. And then a function name, which we can then call later. A pair of parentheses, that's important to note it's a function. Um, we haven't passed anything in this case. And indeed, we'll see an example in a minute where we might not always need to. Um, if it's especially if it's in the same cell or in the part of the same memory. Um, we've also got the colon, so that like our conditional statements. We saw that, didn't we? If that condition's true, then, then run the following block of code. We've got that here too. And it so happens in this case I'm returning it, so I don't lose it. <laughs> it doesn't just happen and not be assigned anywhere. Okay. Um, I could immediately print it if I want to, but I might want to set this up so I can print later. I, indeed, I could even have another function for output. I could even have a define print method or define output details function. Okay. Can I just ask a question on the return there, Nick? Yes. You about keeping it. Yes, return. keeping it. Yes. Because you don't have to use a return there, is that, is that right? You could assign it, because it will assign it to a variable. We could do when it gets called, it assumes the variable uh, is being, is that? Well, if we didn't have return, I wouldn't be able to write that. Though. Right. I would have to say name equals input. Yeah. In that case, I'd have to have a, a, a defined storage place for it. Um, I could I could say that name is this, and then print name later. Yeah. But I've set it up to return it so that I can actually have a variable elsewhere that it's assigned to. Not in the function. Not in the function. Right. Okay, that's the key with return. That's the so key you with return. Another variable in the function. Yeah. Or you can have it outside if you use the return. Exactly, okay. exactly, yeah, that's exactly it, yeah, because uh, I will get lost, if I'm not assigning it anywhere, I'm not returning it, I'll, I'll type it in, it's just not going to be kept anywhere, yes. <laughs> um, so that storage, again, comes back to the fundamentals of variables, yeah. and, and, and its that. existence then, once it's returned, is infinite while the program's running, and you can literally... Whilst the program's running, yes, indeed, yeah, so whilst the program continues to run, um, indeed, if you use Anaconda, it's kept in the cache as well, so you can kind of turn back to it later and, and capture it there. Indeed, we'll have some exercises where you can have multiple cells and you can refer to variables defined higher up. As long as you've run them, they will be in the memory, so that you can, you can refer back to them if they're on the local host. Um, so, yes, a, pr a flow and precedence does, um, not precedence, sorry, where you scope, it, where you keep things becomes quite important in when we get into functions. And it will become a little bit more complex when we get into classes and objects too, as well, because we'll organise our functions into classes. But that's coming up next lecture. <laughs> all right, all good. Um, so, uh, yes, there we go. That's one example. Just show you one more, and we'll wrap up. Uh, we've got one more example here. Different context, different situation. 
Um, I am still returning though, so let's start here. Def define this add function. So, okay, the uh, parentheses. Okay, well, what we're doing, we're returning, oh, I'm returning variables. I'm later going to define. Interesting. Okay, so we haven't actually got values for them right now. So they kind of become variables at that point. And I, I later give them values, which can then be picked up by uh, the function type. Because when you are something x and y variables on line four and five, uh -huh. can't you also take in inputs as for variables? Oh yeah, we could get them from the keyboard. Yeah, yeah, we could do that. We could we could put the input statement there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, that's that's true. I wanted to, yeah. The purpose of this was to illustrate actually we can refer to variables in this place before we later yeah. later assign values for them. Absolutely, as long as it's in the same cell or even the same program, we can do this. So in previous languages you wouldn't be able to. Uh, you'd have to give them values. It'd probably say variable not initialized. It's not been defined. It's not been initialized. Uh, but here Python's a little bit more flexible in that uh, you can set things up to later define the values, as we're doing here. So that when we come down to here, and we add, it's going to take the values from what they were assigned to when we ran the program. So we define the function first, and then we assign the values, and then call add, and it used the updated, the assigned values, which are 8 and 10, add them together, return them, and we actually print that to the screen, as we see here. I didn't store it in this case, but I did return it so that it could be used somewhere. Um, I suppose you could also just say X and Y, but remember that's going to be printed to the screen. Uh, you would then lose it. I wouldn't be able to assign it because after it's been printed to the screen, um, the flow has gone to there rather than to a variable. It's not been stored in the variable. Okay, uh, in that case. So, that's uh, a little indicator of to, as to what's to come. Uh, so, uh, there we go. That's a little introduction to functions for you, as well as selection, iteration, and operators. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this lecture.